Thank you for joining us today. Um, today, our CEO, Diana Verdenieto, will be in conversation with the founders of two great British brands, George Morgan Granville, CEO and founder of the award-winning travel company Red Savannah, and Catherine Hooker, founder and creative director of the eponymous uh, brand specialized in ready-to-wear and custom-made coats and jackets. In this webinar, they will be discussing the power of local business throughout the pandemic. Um, please submit your questions anytime during the webinar and our two panelists will answer them at the end. Over to you, Diana. Hi, Claudia. Thank you uh, very much. And thank you very much, um, Catherine and, and George, for joining us today uh, in the power of local. And um, it's a real honor to, to have you um, you know, here today. And, you know, you are part of these great British brands curated by uh, Country Townhouse. And, you know, I was very inspired reading about your business and, and being here with founders of, of business that have been grown and set up in the UK. Um, I mean, these been challenging times for everyone. And George, I guess, uh, for you has been, uh, very challenging times because you have obviously a travel company, same with you, Catherine, in fashion. But I'm very interested in terms of how has COVID-19 really impacted your business? And perhaps I'd like to start with you, Catherine. Yeah, um, well, it's impacted it um, quite dramatically. Uh, it happened very suddenly, uh, very unexpectedly. Uh, and so we've sort of been going from strength to strength and uh, we were just sort of embarking on, our, on, on a year of making real, uh, be, being able to afford to make real investments in um, other areas, marketing and um, all sorts of exciting things that we've been uh, sort of saving up for as it were because we i i pretty i pretty much i'm doing this alone sort of trading into growth um very sort of carefully so um it was it was all set to be quite an exciting year um but obviously that that hasn't happened so it's just it's done a complete reverse and uh, back to basics you know furloughed staff um I would normally be, I do quite a lot of business in the States. I have a big events and trunk shows business in the States. That's obviously not going to happen this year and probably not next year either, but that's about, you know, close to 30% of the business. <clears throat> uh, and um, the shop is obviously closed. So, so we have gone completely online, which is doing better than, than it has in the past. So that's kind of keeping us going um which is fantastic and uh so we're, we're we're okay we've got our head above the water and um but we've just had to act very fast and and you know complete complete change of, of plans for the year um so yeah it's impacted the business and everybody in the business obviously it's impacted me i should be in the states at the moment um and uh so yeah it, it's kind of it's been so it's been so fast and it's happened so fast that it's 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 been hard to really look at how it's how it's affected us if you know what i mean like it obviously has affected us but um we're so busy just um being in a sort of reactive mode at the moment that it's hard to say but yeah it's 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 impacted sales massively um, because of the shop being closed and because of the states, but you know, online is doing better than before. So, you know, I'm hoping that we'll be um, that we'll be okay. You are not alone, and I think every industry, every business, not just in the UK but around the world, is in exactly the same boat. So, yeah. you know, uh, but here, this is why we are doing this webinar is to really kind of change. I guess scars and learn from each other and maybe you have ideas we have ideas the people are listening um you know can you start thinking about things differently from your experiences so yeah this is exactly why we're why we're doing this so thank you very much for, for sharing and for your for your honesty um yes. george um how about you well we started red savannah was started 
started in, in 2011, so nine, nine years ago. And I don't think we've had a single year where we've had less than about 27% growth. Uh, beginning of this year, we were actually 60% ahead of same time last year. I took on another six members of staff uh, in January. And um, obviously, in <laughs> February, things started to look like they were going a bit pear-shaped. And in March, they did go pear-shaped. So we've lost, uh, um, we've lost basically 100% of our second quarter business. We may also lose 100% of our third quarter business. I mean, it's still uh, not everything has been postponed or moved, um, but um, there may still be some villa business to be had in France, uh, possibly Italy and possibly Spain. Um, but that remains to be seen uh, at this stage. So it's had a, obviously a pretty serious impact on cash flow, uh, which was entirely unexpected. And um, I think with where, where travel is slightly different to the retail business is that unlike uh, a shop, you cannot simply close a travel company down because uh, all the bookings that have been made have actually got to be unwound again. And a lot of the bookings that we do are very complicated um, and logistically quite challenging. And so trying to work with multiple suppliers across the world to undo all the bookings that have been made, make sure that the funds that have been paid out, the prepayments are safe, uh, and then rebook the bookings to either Q4 this year or, or 2021 is an enormous challenge and, and we furloughed um, about half the team uh, and so the other half the team have got double the amount to do and obviously it's completely non-revenue producing work um, so it's it's pretty pretty difficult pretty thankless but we have an enormously good uh, team uh, they're very enthusiastic they're very competent and um, we'll see it through Thank you. I mean, yes, I, um, somebody asked me the other day, I was doing an interview and somebody asked me, what is the thing that inspires you? And actually I have to say what inspires me is my team because obviously you can't be 100% all the time and definitely as a business leader, you have your good days and your bad days. But my team has been amazing into being understanding and picking me up when I was down and vice versa. Hopefully they feel the same. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, the benefits of having a, a fantastic team, it, it, it really is brilliant because more than anything else, they are in the same human boat than we are in terms of, you know, they have families, uh, some of them are alone, uh, you know, yeah, some of them are with the parents. It's really tough for everybody. So I think that empathy and that solidarity, regardless of your position, it's incredibly important just like coming coming in touch with your humanity more than your position in the business is is incredibly crucial in in these times and um, i guess the next question is like perhaps with you catherine um is local supply chains so yeah. you know we are more interconnected interdependent than we have ever been before and a lot of the businesses had supply chains in italy in spain in china and so on but uh, the benefits of a local supply chain, is that a competitive advantage? Is this going to be something that perhaps companies will be looking in the future? I mean, what, is your, what are your thoughts uh, with this? Because you have a, uh, an amazing brand, Slow Fashion. Um, so if you can share a little bit with us, it would be yeah. great. Well, I, I, you know, being, um, having things made locally has always been like number one priority since day one. And uh, it's just made, you know, it makes all the difference. I mean, our, our workshop is, is in London. Um, it's, it's not my workshop, but they don't make for anybody else but me. So with there's, there's, you know, there's somebody there, every, somebody from Catherine Hooker there every day of the week, if not two people. Um, <clears throat> they were very nervous at first to go in to, to work, but, uh, you know, I, I got a set of keys from them like on day one and have been going back and forth to the factory, you know, three or four times a week, um, which, you know, I, I live alone, I drive alone, I'm there in the factory alone, so it's all completely safe. Um, and, uh, and it's just been actually fantastic. You know, there, there's been a lot about, about this whole situation that I've really enjoyed, I must say, because I do so much traveling. And so my, my reach is far, 
but but the the, the operations are very local um, and you know we buy our materials uh, mainly in the UK we do get some materials from from Italy and Austria but so far that hasn't been a problem um, but you know having the workshop on my doorstep it's just I don't think I don't know how we could have survived without that because um, you know I've got I've been in business now for 17 years or whatever and we've been working together for that amount of time and so all of our materials are there all of our patterns are there everything is there so I can go there whenever I want and there's a, it's like a treasure trove of, of of materials that have been you know building up over the years um, some you know they, they go out of stock we bring new things in and out but we have lots of ends that um, that uh, you know we are able to make collections from uh, we can do you know our, the, the 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 pattern cutting everything is done locally so operations haven't really needed to stop most of us have, most of the staff are furloughed I've just kept one one girl um, and myself um, and uh, and we're just working brilliantly as a team um, and in some ways in some ways it's been fantastic because I the amount of times that I've said god I just wish I could you know hit the pause button for three months uh, and just really look at what we're doing and look at all of look as things have, have gone at such a pace and have grown at such a pace that it's been it's been we never have the time to stop you know so but you, you can't put go on pause for three months unless the entire world goes on pause for three months <laughs> and that's exactly what's happened so it's like you know in some ways it's been um it's been fantastic but really because everything is so so local and um you know we're working that now that manufacturing can go back to work um the people who make them feel much more comfortable we've got a whole sort of social social distancing um uh, process in in place and uh so I, I can't imagine what that would have been like if we had been, if our operations and our manufacturing was, was in a different country, even a different part of England. Um, so it, it, it's been a huge, huge advantage. In terms of like moving forward for other, other companies, um, I, I don't know, my, 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 um, my driving force really for having things local more than anything was to be in control you know of the quality and also to build good relationships with the with the manufacturers with suppliers for me it's all about relationships so um and that's the lovely thing about slow fashion is that you can have a relationship with a person who's actually making your uh you know your your pieces um so it depends i think on what what will drive people in the future obviously most things are driven by by profit um and i think if people find themselves to be driven by more than just profit then i think those which maybe the coronavirus will will kind of adjust people's values a bit um it will do that but i i think that if there's somewhere in the world where things can be made cheaper and people are driven by profit, that's what they're going to be driven by. But hopefully, um, you know, consumers and um, suppliers to the consumers will, you know, their values hopefully will have adjusted a bit, which would be amazing to, to see manufacturing coming back to, to England and with the support of people like you and, you know, so, uh, I, I think for me, it's everything. Local is, is everything. Thank you so much. Um, George, I'm curious uh, because you have a, a great experience of this and, and we have been discussing uh, a bit about this uh, yesterday. Um, you know, what do you think the travel industry will look like uh, post pandemic? Um, what does your crystal ball say? <laughs> Uh, my crystal ball is getting bigger uh, every day uh, as more and more parameters start to get challenged. Um, I think it's, I, first of all, I think it's impossible to try and predict anything beyond the next sort of six to 12 months. 
um, as it all depends on a whether COVID-19 goes away and if it doesn't whether somebody discovers a vaccine because those two things are the really the, the game changers um, but I think overall um, this pandemic is going to act as an accelerator uh, of change um, and I think uh, things that might have happened anyway are probably going to happen quicker than they would have done uh, otherwise. Um, I think in, to put it down to its sort of component parts, I think in terms of air, uh, I think there'll be less frequent uh, flights and I think they'll be more expensive. Um, I think there'll be longer check-in times at airports. Um, planes will need to stay longer on the ground to have to be desanitized. Uh, there'll probably be temperature checks at the airport. Um, people who have access to lounges are going to find them a lot more sterile than they were before. There'll probably be no more buffets in the lounges. There'll be just pre-packaged, pre-wrapped food. Uh, there'll be much less personal service on board aircraft uh, from the crew. Uh, and I think you'll see for short haul travel, I think you'll see an exponential rise in private jet uh, use. Um, in terms of travel products around the world, I think there will be a strong demand for low density accommodation. Uh, so private villas, uh, safari camps, uh, resorts that have got uh, detached villas and suites, um, um, travel to very remote places, so the Himalayas, um, for example, and also places less affected by coronavirus, so New Zealand, Australia, Costa Rica, those sort of destinations that don't seem to have been so badly uh, affected. Um, I, think, I think the cruise lines will be more, more challenged. Um, I think the guess the question is, will passengers want to go on uh, cruises? And actually, will destinations want them? Uh, will a destination want 3,000 people suddenly being disgorged into a town uh, in short order? Uh, and I think that's, a, that's probably a big question for the cruise industry. Um, I think countries themselves will use the pandemic um, to make politically difficult decisions to deal with over-tourism. Um, there were certainly issues prior to this pandemic breaking out, places like Venice, I was in the news uh, a lot, Barcelona was in the news uh, a lot. And there are many places around the world where tourism had just got to too big a proportion uh, in terms of um, the volume versus the local population uh, and places were getting uh, trampled. Um, and for governments, it's a very difficult problem to deal with because it's the local, local people's livelihoods. Um, but nevertheless, it is something that needs to be dealt with. And this is a perfect opportunity uh, to, to deal with that. Um, I think there will be a revolution in the supply chain probably for travel. You know, you've had a, for, for as many years as I've been in it, um, people have required or operators have required large deposits uh, up front and then a balance payment at 60 to 90 days in advance of travel. Uh, the airlines have employed increasingly uh, draconian and in many cases unfair practices as regards cancellation terms uh, and fees. And I think the consumer is not going to buy this anymore. A lot of people have had their fingers burnt trying to buy holidays and have found they can't take them and they can't get their money back. And I think going forward, people will be expect to pay far lower deposits. And I think they'll be able to um, expect to pay their balance at a much later stage. And I think they'll be able to expect to be, to be able to cancel uh, up until a much later stage. And so those are all things that we're talking about with our suppliers to try and make travel easier uh, for the consumer. Um, what else? I think there will be a decline in, in sort of celebrities and travel and influencers and travel. I think people are bored uh, with that sort of thing now. I don't think it makes a difference what an influencer likes. People make able to make up their own mind. Uh, and I think this is the sort of pandemic has kind of leveled the playing field a bit. Um, safety will be very important. Um, insurance will be very important. And insurance companies that have behaved well during the pandemic and actually can cater for people's needs going forward will be in demand. Um, I think uh, we'll see um, a decline in the sort of homogeneity 
um, of airports around the world. It's actually quite boring going through a lot of airports around the world. They're all exactly the same, same shop, same change. I think you're going to see more local. I think people are going to desire to see more local and artisanal business appearing rather than these sort of slightly homogenous chains. Um, and then I think the last thing is there is going to be a dichotomy between what governments want and suggest and what both businesses and hotels um, and clients are going to be willing to put up with. And it's all very well to say that there has to be social distancing on a beach or in a hotel or in a restaurant. But actually, what's the, what's the reality of that? If, a, if a, uh, a hotel is operating a restaurant and people have to sit two meters apart, there may not be enough covers in the restaurant to be able to make that restaurant commercially viable. So it may not work. And, and secondly, how do people, are people going to go, go in swimming pools? Uh, and where are they going to sunbathe? And, and if a hotel hasn't got an enormous swimming pool, um, maybe there's not space to put enough loungers around the pool. So there's a lot of really practical issues here that are going to have to be considered. And our view is that the people who want to travel are going to be less sensitive to social distancing. I just think there is a there's a practical issue with social distancing. And I think if you're really, really worried about it, you're probably not going to travel. And if you're less worried about it, you're probably going to travel and uh, you're going to be prepared to bump into other people in corridors or staircases or by swimming pools or, or on the beach. And I think it's, it's going to be impossible not to. Thank you. I mean, that was uh, just mind blowing, really interesting. And uh, thank you so much for, for sharing. Um, I mean, what do you think are the opportunities that the luxury industry is, is seeing today and, and how can the different industries uh, change, um, you know, change for the better? Uh, what do you think, and what do you think those changes will be? I mean, either you or, or, or uh, George or, or Catherine could take the question first. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I think that um, I think that the, this whole situation has highlighted so many things that are wrong with the with the fashion industry, with fast fashion. Um, you know, the it. It just it, it exacts an unbelievable toll on 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 the environment, the fast fashion. And I think something like uh, I think Primark has merchandise to the value of two billion pounds, waiting, you know, sitting in warehouses um, that 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 can't be sold. And six, sixty percent, I think, of fast fashion ends up in a landfill within a year. Um, so. You know that 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 really has to change. That that can't kind of that's it really is unsustainable. Um, so I I think hopefully you know that there will be less of that insanity. The the the, the insanity of of design of of designing four hundred pieces four times a year to keep up with. Um, to keep up with sort of to, to 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 sort of demonstrate changing styles and it's just insanity and it's it's something I've never wanted to uh, be be a part of and I, I, just, I just don't understand it doesn't make any sense to me at all um, and you know thing fashions used to go on for at least a decade um, in, in the old days before mass manufacturing you know you would have a fashion that would be in in, in the old days they would be things would be in fashion for as long as a, a, a monarch was in rain or reigning or an emperor was reigning or something. And now they change, you know, every fashions change every year, which is, which is just crazy. Um, and, you know, that obviously there will be communities that will be impacted really negatively by the, the, the sort of decline of fast fashion. So that's got to all, all those things have to be addressed, but, um, I would, I would hope that, that that you know bigger companies would see an opportunity to really slow things down, make things really well, make things to last in terms of quality and and um, and, and style, um, and 
you know, slow, slow down this, this, in, this totally unsustainable industry. So that's what I would really hope to see this, this thing, you know, because it's, it's highlighted all these, all these things and that, that we all knew about, but, um, it's, it's becoming much more obvious and with even, you know, coronavirus or no coronavirus, it's just not, it's not sustainable. So I would hope that it would, you know, really that, that, that bigger companies would see an opportunity and, and, and make those changes. Um, absolutely. I mean, you, I think you, you, you said it rightly in terms of like, you know, the, the, uh, the speed of cycles is too fast. The speed of everything is too fast. It's not just yeah. fashion. It's also, you know, beauty and, and the rest also is like, you know, kind of these accelerations to, towards more, more, more. And it's, um, is that, yeah, it's the pace of change, which is kind of overwhelming. I think hopefully this was perhaps slow us a little bit. And I think the other, the other issue, not the other thing, issue but the other thing to to remember is you know fashion weeks has been in the debate pre-corona uh in terms of the impact of that now i mean that is sorted solved because we can do it digitally and perhaps uh you know more people will be um will be uh be able to participate and yeah. the other thing is this idea of discounts versus you know full price i think that you know having a more digital um, showroom because obviously fashion week you will not be able to go there so showrooms need to be digitally made so you know press and so on can visit them so having a digital showroom will also enable to have less samples made or no samples made yeah. and um, at the same time um, you know maybe there is no need for discounts so things will be much more vertically integrated uh, and full price will become the norm. Um, yeah. Also, that will slow things down. Um, right, exactly. So, you know, I think I, I was saying this pre-pandemic, but I think it's, it's good to highlight that perhaps instead of chasing growth, we should be chasing profit, like in the old days. Um, and, and margins. And exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, George, what, 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 are your, what are your tips on this? Or what are your thoughts? Well, in, in terms of the opportunities, I, mean, I think there are lots of opportunities. I think, I think Catherine's articulated uh, some, of them, uh, some of them very well. And I certainly agree on the um, establishing sort of the green credentials of a brand. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're certainly making much more of an effort to work with suppliers who empower local communities. Uh, and I think that's a good thing for the local community. I think it's a good thing for the, for the businesses. And I think it's a good thing for the consumer. And I think people uh, would generally put their money where their heart is now. And I think one of the things that may well come out of this pandemic is that people take a, uh, a more emotional look at the brands they interact with. Um, and they will want to know more about those brands. You know, are, they a good, are they good people or bad people? Are they just chasing profit at the expense of the environment and the local people? Um, or are they actually chasing profit but doing good at the same time. And I think if you don't fall into the latter category, um, you need to revise your, your strategy. Um, I think it's a good opportunity to cement trust with clients. Um, you know, there's nothing like seeing how a brand reacts in a crisis to really get to know it well. And um, I think brands that behave well, again, will really to be able to develop a good, strong, loyal clientele and those that don't are the opposite. Um, but I also think, as, you know, as far as the travel industry is concerned, the travel industry um, represents about 10% of the world's GDP, and it also accounts for about 10% of the world's employment. It's a very, very important industry globally. And in the UK, um, I think the government should use this as an opportunity to get to understand the industry better. I mean, the, the outbound travel industry in the UK accounts for about 15.9 billion pounds to contribute 15.9 billion pounds towards the economy um, and yet I don't know I defy anybody to know who the tourism minister is I don't even know whether we have a minister of tourism um, and yet for you know for such an enormous um, economic driver uh, why isn't there a minister dedicated to to this to this sector 
um, it seems to me uh, to be an opportunity that's been wasted. Um, and I also think lastly that um, it's an opportunity to create, to create value. Um, and I think money may be harder to come by when this pandemic is over. And I, I say hard to come by, but I mean both from a financing standpoint, but also from a spending standpoint. And I think consumers who have been hit um, will really be searching for products and services that offer value for money. And I think every brand is going to be able to need to demonstrate that that's exactly what it offers. Mm, yeah. Thank you very much. And um, I have one last question, but um, I'm also conscious of, of time. So I want to take some of the uh, questions from, from the, the viewers. Um, there is a question that if, either for you, George, or for Catherine. Um, the question says, uh, a lot of what everybody has spoken about has been about the previous unsustainable state of things. But what about is stopping us resuming this as soon as we are able to? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I didn't hear that. So it says, a lot of what everybody has spoken about has been about the previous unsustainable state of things. But what is stopping us resuming these as, as soon as we are able to? In other words, are we likely just to go straight back to our old ways? Exactly. Um, well, it, again, it depends on... on in the, in, the, in the near future, there are so many unknowns. Um, so it, de it depends, first of all, when things will get back to normal, if everything, if, if things get back to normal. I mean, if there are, if there are restrictions in the way that we live um, and move around and travel and buy and, and uh, you know, it, it will change, th things will change. Um, but I, I think it depends a lot on the consumer, but it also, it could be, it would be great if this could be an opportunity for, um, uh, like George put it really well, you know, why isn't there a minister for, 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 for tourism? Um, and it would be great if we could actually play, rather than just constantly, you know, look beyond our plea for, for resources, basically, and, and um, and somehow play a part in shaping the way things move forward as business owners. Um, um, because it's so interesting, it's so interesting to hear um, George speaking about his industry. And I think that's another thing that's, that's, that's really unique about this situation is that we're all learning about each other's industries. I mean, we're, I'm learning so much about the arts, uh, how, how they function, how they're going to function in the future. Um, and now I'm learning so much about about uh, George's industry, and you really get a you get a sense that it's all connected. You know, um, George mentioned something about you know countries like New Zealand and Australia maybe being more attractive because they're safer and cleaner and all the rest of it. I mean, I never even thought about that. I never thought that you know the UK is not doing so great on its you know death rate and numbers and number of cases and stuff. So it just made me think, God, maybe, maybe, maybe my American customers, I have loads of American customers who come to me in London. Um, maybe they won't be able to feel comfortable coming to the UK anymore. Um, so it just, you know, all the, we're all so connected that it, it's, it's, hard to, it, it's hard to believe that there, there, there won't be some kind of a change um, because all of us, will sort of demand it in some way. Um, and I'm definitely not a kind of like, oh, this is all so wonderful. We're all becoming so much more spiritual. This is really gonna change the world. And there are fishes fly, you know, swimming around in Venice and all that sort of stuff. I'm really cynical. I'm just like, as long as people can, you know, as there's a way to make money, the people will be driven by that. But I, I do really think that because we are, we under, we're, we're, we're sort of developing an understanding of how connected we are and where there are, you know, other values in, in, in life, um, rather than just profit, it, it, I just think it will change. But it, it's, obviously it's impossible to, to, to know uh, how and if things will really change. Um, but it, it's going to be fascinating to, to see how things do emerge. 
because there's so much innovation going on at the moment. People are, people are really struggling to survive. So, um, you know, the, when, when things start opening up again, and if there is ever a vaccine or if people just get fed up with this way of living and, you know, uh, sort of emerge back into the world and travel and become more demanding and uh, it, it'll just be, it'll be very interesting to see how, how things emerge because, uh, you know, technology is, is, is really emerging. You know, God, I wish I'd bought shares in Zoom. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, there's, if this had happened 20 years ago, it would be a completely different story. Well, there's no such thing as the internet practically 20, uh, you know, 20 years ago. So it's so unprecedented. It's like, it's, it's like virgin territory in a way, how, how we're going to come out of it. But I do feel like there is a, a genuine feeling that of, of how connected we all are, you know, you know, air travel has completely pr pretty almost stopped altogether. That, that, the lack of <clears throat> air travel makes you realize how connected you are to the, to the rest of the world. So um, I don't know how you would stop it going back to the, its old ways, but I, I would be surprised. I think it's just gonna change things forever. You can't change, you can't change the, the, the market. I mean, the market will do what the market will do. And I think if, you yeah. know, if COVID disappears and um, people still want to buy cheap things and all the manufacturing takes place in China, I mean, you know, the difference is but, you know, when SARS happened, China controlled about 4% of the world's GDP. And I think it now controls about 17% of the world's GDP. So it's a vastly different time now. The economies are much less balanced than they were in 2003. Mm. But I think, you know, I personally, I think there's been a, or the, there will be a sort of paradigm shift in, uh, in people's priorities. And, and I think from a, a sort of security standpoint, people will want, uh, they'll want to make sure that their, their health is protected um, and they will want to make sure they're financially protected. I think there's been a lot of people have been exposed uh, in this crisis. Um, I do think, and it was happening anyway, these environmental and social responsibility concerns, you know, those are, going, those are not going to go away. And, and certainly uh, um, sort of the Gen Zers uh, and the millennials are much, much more concerned uh, than that than previous generations were. And I also think there's been, there's been a slow migration away from conspicuous consumption um, over the last five years or so. And I think we're seeing, even though wealth has been increasing, we're seeing people wanting more in the way of experiences um, as opposed to amassing uh, materiality. Um, and so I think those things are going to stay. Um, and as I said right at the start of this, this is the pandemic is going to act as an accelerator of change. Absolutely. And um, um, so in the, in, in the interest of time, I will ask you, George and Catherine, if you can really quickly go to your Q&As and answer the questions and type the questions to our participants, because we don't have time to answer them all live. So that would be incredibly um, grateful if you could do that. And I just wanted to thank you very much for your wisdom and your insights and your time and actually hand over to Claudia. So thank you so much for joining us today. Over to Claudia. Thank you very much, Catherine and George. It has been a very interesting webinar. So next Thursday, we'll be uh, on Zoom uh, with um, three amazing guests discussing the power of resilience. So um, sign up to our newsletter today to register your, uh, for this webinar, to reserve your spot, and we hope that you can join. Thank you all for joining today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you.